Well, good morning, Redemption Church. My name is Joel Oates. I'm the West Campus pastor, and it is so good to see you this morning. I want to start out by telling you we've been praying for you. We know this season is really difficult, um, but we're here, and we love standing beside you. Perhaps you're joining us this morning by pulling us up online or, or tuning in by radio. Uh, many of you might have even been invited by friends or family this morning. Neighbors uh, are coming over, or, and, or maybe you're curled up on a couch with kids or listening from a car. Regardless of who you are, regardless of where you are, we are so thankful that you've joined us this morning. And our hope and our prayer is that you feel so welcome throughout our entire time together. I think I should let you know that something you really need to understand about Redemption Church is that we love getting to know people here. And one of the best ways for us to do that is by asking you to fill out one of our connection cards. Uh, if you notice, on the right-hand side, you'll see a chat box. And in that chat box, you're going to see a link. And, and that link brings you straight to one of our Connect cards. Maybe you're on our, our app or our website, and you're going to see a link that says Connect. Would you do us a favor? Would you click that link um, and fill out that form sometime this morning and then click Submit? That's going to allow us to begin to connect with you. It's going to allow us to begin to pray for you and, and care for both you and your family. It also allows us a chance to get to know you a little bit better and allow you a chance to get to know us a little bit better. We believe everyone here has a next step and this Connect card is a great way to discover who we are and how you can begin to get plugged in, which for some of you means finding community and we need community. And that starts by connecting in a grow group or, or for others it might be learning how you can serve in some way here at Redemption Church. Listen, there is no better time to get involved with Redemption Church than right now. And we just want to help you learn how to do that in the best possible way. It's such a joy to have you join us this morning. And God has truly been speaking to us since the beginning of this year when we began our study through the book of Romans. And today, Pastor Ed is going to be looking at the second part of chapter 5, which you'll discover really shows the sickness of man and the condition that we really are in. But it also shows our hope, the hope that we have in Christ and how Christ is our antidote that we've always been looking for. So let's join our worship team this morning. Let's join our hearts and our voices in seeking Him and seeking His face. And again, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Good morning, Redemption Church. We welcome you on this Palm Sunday. And we believe with all of our hearts that the church is a people and not a place. So as the church scattered, we invite you to sing with us and give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and his steadfast love that endures forever. Let's sing the doxology together. Sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creation. Name together. 
together sing praise the Father sing praise the Father praise the Son yes praise the Spirit three in one God of glory majesty praise forever to the King from Psalm 139. Verses 7 through 10 say this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. It's in times like these that we can hold on to our strength and our hope because of the promises that we have been given. So let's continue singing in the full knowledge that the Lord is with us.
Justice has been satisfied He will hold me fast Raised with Him to endless life He will hold me fast Till our faith is turned to side When He comes at last He will hold me What an incredible time we've had worshiping our God together. It's just so sweet with our voices lifted high. Um, right now, we're going to enter into a time in our service where we continue on in a time of worship, into a form of worship, especially in the area of our finances. And, and we call this the tithe. Uh, the tithe is where we return the first 10% of our income back to God in an act of obedience. This understand this specifically reminds us that, that God is the provider of all of our resources. And, and the least that we can do in love is to return the first 10% back to his local church. And we want to continue to be faithful, um, especially in this season. Listen, when you give to Redemption Church, uh, people are going to be served. Families have a safe place to learn about Jesus. Neighborhoods are filled with grow groups. Campuses are able to to serve their community's needs. Mission partners are, are able to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and our new world is gonna be forever impacted because of your faithfulness. Your faithfulness changes lives, and it's gonna to continue to change lives as we continue to trust the Lord in every area of our life. Uh, listen, we've made it so easy for you to continue to be faithful in giving. And we've given you three different options and three different ways that you can continue to engage in this. Uh, you can go to the, our website at goredemption.com slash give. You can give via text. Or, or you can go to the Go Redemption app that you have currently on your phone or platform. Listen, when we choose to put God first in our lives, He always shows up in amazing ways. Thank God that we have a faithful God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much that you are the provider of all good and perfect things. Lord Jesus, as we worship you, not just in voice, but in our, in our resources and in our tithe and our offerings, Lord Jesus, would it bring you glory. Thank you that we can worship you in every area of our life and trust you with every area in our life because you will see us through. God, we love you. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, good morning, Redemption Church. It is a joy to be together. And uh, even though we're separated, the Holy Spirit of God brings us together on this Palm Sunday to look at the Word of God and to allow the Word of God to speak into our lives. I hope you're doing well. We are praying for one another. So thankful for the body of Christ and all that God is doing in our midst. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verse 12 through verse 21. This morning's message is entitled, Pandemic. In the front of the New York City Library, there are two stately statues of lions. Kayla and I were just there about a year and a half ago, and we took a picture of one of those lions at Christmas time. In the 1930s, Mayor LaGuardia of New York City gave names to these two statues. These two lions he named Patience and Fortitude. And he did it because these two qualities he felt New York citizens needed to survive the economic disaster of the Great Depression. Paul is writing in the book of Romans to you and to me in just such difficult times. He's not writing to a theological nerd herd at a seminary 
He's writing to real people, some of them under great stress, under terrible, dis- terrible strain and pain in their lives. But he's laying a foundation of an unshakable fortress to be built in the Christian heart. You see, the desire of this pastor, to be very candid with you, is to give you practical teaching. Because I believe the Word of God is practical. I don't believe I make it practical. But I love to give you things that you can, news that you can use, news that changes your life today. You just have to know my heart. I've often thought of leaving this study in Romans and going to something that would be more directly applicable to what you're going through. And the more I read the book of Romans, I cannot leave. Because this foundation that Paul gives us in this in the midst of this worldwide pandemic, this foundation is exactly what you need. You don't need Ed Litton's comforting words, confident assertions, or wishful predictions. You need the solid rock of truth and the Holy Spirit of God reminding you that you have a foundation that will not be shaken. All of Romans is Paul making a big deal about Jesus. Matter of fact, the first four chapters, he says, we are justified by Christ alone, in faith alone, in Christ alone. And he makes the argument for Christ in chapter five, verse one through 11, we saw last week. He shows us the very foundation of our hope, our joy, and our peace. But now in chapter 12, verse 12 through 21, Paul goes beneath the relief. He turns to the root cause of our human dilemma the crisis we find ourselves in today. He shows us the root of all suffering, of all pain and death and separation. Haven't you wondered why this, why now, why us, why me? The one thing about this crisis that our world is in, it is a worldwide crisis. But like those who first read the book of Romans, Paul wants us to understand what God is doing in the midst of that crisis. And we need to put our hope in a God, not in false things. We need to put our hope in God and what his word says, not in things that we hope so or dream so or wish so. It is good good to have patience and fortitude, as Mayor LaGuardia wished for his people in the 1930s, as long as our hope is in the right place. You see, T.S. Eliot said of that same time period in the early 1940s, Americans were waiting without hope because we have hoped in the wrong things. Can I ask you, where is your hope in the midst of this crisis? Where is your hope today about your job, about paying bills, about your family, about sickness, about health? Patience and fortitude are not two lion statues. They are the work of the Holy Spirit of God when your life is on the foundation of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. One thing this crisis is doing in my heart, and I'm praying and believing God is doing this in yours or that he will do this in yours, is that your life will be put on no other foundation but Christ. We've all become overnight experts in pandemic language. But today as we turn to Romans chapter five, beginning in verse 12. I want you to have the terms of pandemic in mind. I want you to use these words that we're becoming familiar with, more familiar than we wish we were. Wasn't it nice when we didn't have to use these words? Wasn't it nicer when life seemed to be ignorant of these things that we're now aware of? I want you to think of three points to this message. I want you to see the virus, I want you to see the antidote, and I want you to see the application. The virus, the antidote to that virus, and the application of that antidote to our lives. So let's look first at the virus, Romans 5, 12. This is the word of God. Therefore, Paul writes, therefore, that means everything he said up to now about our hope, our joy, all of those things are found in our justification by grace through faith. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet 
death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those sinning, those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who would come. Whenever a big word appears in scripture, I feel compelled to tell you or explain what it is. The word transgression for many, maybe something you're familiar with. For, for others, you're, you may not use that word on a regular basis. It simply means in the original language to step over the limit. God gave Adam a limit. He said, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but not this one. And Adam and Eve stepped over that limit. You see, this passage begins by telling us about the virus of sin that allows the virus called corona to travel all over the world and wreak havoc in people's lives, cause economic disaster. You see, the idea that one man's sin would infect all of us, quite frankly, is offensive to most Westerners. People in the West, I mean in the United States and Western, what we call Western countries. And like Pilate, we want to wash our hands of the thought that one man many, many millennia ago could sin and infect all of us and infect all of us. But I'm reminded of the old Negro spiritual. Were, were you there? The question is asked. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer is yes, we were there. But we were also here in the book of Genesis, chapter two and chapter three. We, we're also along at the very inception and the origin of this virus. How? Well, the scripture tells us here, Paul is instructing us that we are sinners today because of the original sin. And I want you to see the contagious nature of sin in verse 12. It literally uses contagion language. Verse 12 says, and death spread to all men. That Greek word is interesting. It means it passed, it passed through to. David said, in sin, my mother conceived me. It passed through through Adam, through all the generations down to the day I was born. And it, actually when I was conceived, I, as David said, I was conceived a sinner. But what's interesting is it says then death spread to all men because all men have sinned. And he goes on to say that the world now is controlled by this new king, if you will, called death. The Greek word is the word for a king. So now death rules over us. When you read Genesis chapter five, it's, it's unnerving because it lists the godly men from the line of Seth and it, it mentions their name and how many years and their numbers are huge. But it says their name and the years they had lived and then it says, and they died. And that phrase, and they died, and they died, and they died is repeated over and over again. You see, sin has a chain reaction in this pandemic. It entered the world through one man, Adam, and death came with it and rules our lives. And sin entered one man, and he proves that all of us are infected. Because I am a sinner, it actually proves this doctrine to be true. Because the verse 12 says, and death spread to all men, for all have sinned. The great British philosopher G.K. Chesterton said, original sin is the only doctrine that is empirically, empirically verifi verifiable. Man. I messed that one up. Hang on, folks at home. Original sin is the only doctrine that is empirically verifiable. You see, all sin, all people sin, and all die because of sin. The human mortality rate is still a ratio of one to one. A hundred percent. Nice people die, cruel people die. Young people die, old people die. Innocent infants and sin-laden adults die. If you're a parent, you understand the sin nature that our children inherit from us as we pass it on. And I hate to admit this because I'm a granddad. I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. I hate to admit this, but even my grandchildren are sinners. I know where they got it from. It wasn't me, but I know. I'm not going to name names. But the truth is, parents learn, like, like, in, like in the movie Finding Nemo, we learned that our children are like the seagulls in that movie. Do you remember? They kept saying, mine, 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 mine. No 18-month-old will ever come to his parents and say, mom and dad, I know you're under a lot of stress right now with all this virus stuff going on and the threat to work and everything else. So listen, I'm going to go to bed early tonight uh, and, and just kind of sleep and let you guys have some me time. No one will ever have to send their kids to sin camp to learn how to sin. No one will ever have to enroll their child in a self-centeredness seminar. As a matter of fact, what's really interesting is I came across this, this, uh, this piece 
1926, the Minnesota Crime Commission published a report on why the crime was increasing in Minnesota. And this 1926 report, which by the way, I cannot imagine this being reported today, but this is what they said. Every baby starts life as a little savage. <laughs> he is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. In his, if it's his bottle or his mother's attention or a playmate's toy, his uncle's watch or whatever, deny him these and he, he sees with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He, he, he's dirty. He has no morals no knowledge, no developmental skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, given free reign for the impulsive actions to satisfy each want, every child would grow up to be a criminal, a thief, a killer, and a rapist. Oh my goodness. The Minnesota Crime Commission, Report 1926. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing how we've lost sense of that. We actually believe that people are morally good when in fact the Bible says we've all been infected by a disease. We've all been infected by this viral problem of sin. You see, Adam and Eve, and let's remember this, Adam and Eve's desire seems so innocent to most listening right now, but their desire was to be like God. That's the temptation Satan brought to them. To be like God, to eat of this fruit, you will be like God, you will have knowledge, and God's keeping this from you. He doesn't want you to have that knowledge because he's intimidated by you. He's afraid that if you have that knowledge, he would lose his power. He's laying all kinds of thoughts into their head when in reality what they were saying is, I wanna determine my own destiny. I wanna be the master of my own fate. I wanna be the commander of my own ship of life. And that is exactly the root nature of all sin. We tend to focus on certain sins that we say those are really bad, those are not so bad. Well, the sins, and typically I've discovered of myself, that's usually the sins I enjoy, the things I do, they're not so bad. But what other people do seem to be really bad. You know, many people today are waiting in communities all over America for a viral test kit. But this sin virus has a test kit and it's right here. And everyone's positive. Everyone fails the test. You know, I was doing some research this week. I discovered, I was curious about COVID-19. Well, what does COVID-19 mean? Let me show you on the screen. First of all, the CO stands for the origin. That's the name of the place that it came from. The VI stands for virus, and the D stands for disease, and then there's a dash and the year that it first began, the contagion first began. So when we think about Adam and we think about sin and how contagious it is, what, we should, what should we call this one? It probably should be called the SINVID20 virus. Not that it started in 20, but it is in full active action right now. E even if your struggle with the logic of sin virus, even if you struggle with that logic, you cannot deny the reality of sin or the effect of sin in our world. Sin came to us, Paul says, by one man. My goodness, wouldn't it be wonderful if one man could find a cure, an antidote for sin? Jesus is called the great physician. In Mark 2, 17, he said this to a group of people who thought they were really special. They thought they were above sin. They thought they were better than anybody else. They were highly religious, but they were in a crowd of people who weren't. And I don't know where you fall into that category. You may be watching or listening this morning and you say, I'm the most irreligious person in the world. I wanna say again, welcome. We're glad you're here. You may be sitting next to a person who's highly religious, but listen to what Jesus said. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Turns out the religious and the irreligious are in the same boat. We both have a virus and Jesus is the great physician. So the first thing we see is the virus. Now quickly, the second thing we see is the antidote. Paul then takes our attention to verse 15 through verse 17. Let's just read it real clear and plain and slow. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. This is good news. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. 
For the judgment following the trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift flowing, flowing many trespasses brought justification through many trespasses. In other words, if you're sitting there thinking, I have terrible trespasses in my life, this is good news for you because it doesn't matter how many trespasses you have. Jesus Christ has the antidote for the virus. Verse 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The word justification here appears again. And if you'll remember a few weeks ago, we said this about justification. It is God looking at our life and, and granting us a status with him that says, it's just as if I have never sinned. And it's just as if I had lived a perfect life. There's two sides to that. If you say, just as I have never sinned, that's what justification means, then I would be free from the burden and the condemnation of my sin. But God goes further. It's just as if I've never sinned and just as if I'd lived a perfect life. The life Jesus lived, he gave to me. The life I lived, he took to the cross. And Paul says that in order for this virus to be stopped, another Adam would have to come along, born into the human race. He would be similar only in reverse. You see, Paul is like an epidemiologist here. He's showing us how the antidote is created. And he's explaining the antidote to us. Pay attention. Because the Bible calls, the Bible says there's a first Adam, that's the first Adam, and there's a second Adam, that's Jesus Christ. And they both come at this with different motivations. The first Adam, listen to this, disobeyed one simple command out of self-centeredness and he took from a tree. The second Adam obeyed the father's command and he went to a tree, placing the penalty himself and, his, and the penalties for our sins upon himself on that tree. And there are different outcomes. The first Adam brought sin and death and, and the suffering that our world is going through at this very hour. The second Adam restored us to life. The apostle John seems to capture this in his gospel because in John 1, 1, he opens with these words in the beginning. He takes us back to the garden, back to the creation account. And he says, God created the world out of disorder, out of nothingness. And that he then shows us that Christ came into a disordered world, that Jesus came into this world and brought order out of chaos in the lives of people. Can I tell you, he's still doing that. He did that in my life. And he's doing it in other people's lives. And he will do it in your life. And if you're sitting here today and you know what I just said is true, would you just stop in this moment and worship him and thank him for bringing order out of your disorder? John also points out that Jesus died on the sixth day. That's interesting because that's the day Adam was created. John points out that Jesus was resurrected on the seventh day, showing that he is the new creation. John highlights the crown of thorns in the crucifixion story in his gospel, which is a picture of the curse of sin. Before there was sin, there was no thorns. There were no thistles. There was no pain and suffering. John also tells us that the first person Jesus encountered was Mary. Where did he encounter Mary? In the garden, remember? She thought he was a gardener. So the last place he left a woman, Eve, was in the garden. The first place he reconnects after the resurrection was with a woman in the garden. And John points out that Jesus' first encounter with his disciples past the resurrection was when he breathed on them and said, you will receive the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what God did when he shaped Adam into existence and he breathed into his nostrils the gift of life. John and Paul are on sync together on this, this truth of God's word. Jesus became a curse so that he would reverse the curse. Epidemiologists tell us that's where the cure for the coronavirus will, virus will ultimately come from. It will come from the virus itself. Listen to Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree. We're all condemned by the actions of the first Adam who did what you would have done. Hey, listen, you can get mad at Adam all you want, but I promise you, if Ed Litton had been the first Adam, if it had been Adam Litton, I promise you, I would have done the exact same thing, and so would you. 
Now you can argue that point with me, but I want you to see we're condemned by the first Adam's actions who did what any of us would do, but we're saved by the second Adam's action who did what none of us could do. Die for the sins of the world. He being sinless became sin for us, the Bible says. And people say that's not fair. Why should I suffer for Adam's sin? I'll tell you what's not fair. That the sinless son of God would suffer for my sin. That's not fair. And yet he did it. And he didn't consider it an unfairness. He considered it the only way of our salvation. And for you that are thinking, I, I want to work my way. I don't take nothing off charity. Nobody provides, nobody pays my bills. If I've sinned, I will suffer. I've had men tell me that. And it's a foolish thing to believe. Because the truth is, you will be separated from God forever to pay the price. And I'm here to tell you, Christ loves you and he doesn't want you to pay that price. He has paid that price for you. So we see the virus and we see the antidote, but quickly, let's look at the application of that antidote because this is important. Look at verse 18 of Romans chapter five. He says, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And by the way, that includes women. For mankind, just as death came to us through the first Adam, life comes through the second Adam. Now note the difference though. Even in the wording, death came to all people, but Christ's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all people. So why the difference in wording? Because listen to me, no one is auto-saved. No one is automatically saved. Because Christ died for me and rose again doesn't mean I'm automatically saved. Faith has to be exercised in order to be saved. And not all people can hear the gospel today. That's why this church exists, to tell people the gospel, to share the good news, not just here, but in church planning all across North America and throughout the world. Listen to Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is good news. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Are you willing in your heart to believe that the antidote for our sin and our suffering and all death and ultimately our eternal existence was paid in full by Jesus Christ. If you are, the Bible says, confess him with your mouth. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. John the apostle in John 3, 36 says, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on them. You see, the condition of salvation is that you must believe. Look at verse 17 again of Romans 5. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more. I love how many times Paul in chapter five uses that phrase, much more. Study it this week, look at it, all of them. He says, if, if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You know, every year, Every year they develop a flu vaccine for whatever the current flu is. My doctor gave me that flu vaccine just about a month ago. And you know what he told me? He said only 43% of Americans will even take this shot. 43%. And there's all kinds of reasons people will not accept the flu vaccine. Some are busy. They don't have time. Some are skeptical about vaccinations. Uh, some think they're immune. Uh, too, some think they're too young. Others think they're too old. Some simply forget. Jesus is the one antidote, and without him, you will be lost forever. You could live if you were to take him as your savior. He is the antidote. Why haven't you trusted him? Maybe you think you don't need him. Maybe, maybe you just think you're immune. You're a good person. You're religious. You belong to a prominent denomination. But every human must trust one. And that one, the Bible says, is not the first Adam. It is the second Adam, and his name is Jesus. Look at verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. That word one appears throughout this whole passage almost 12 times from verse 
from verse 12 through verse 21, but I want you to see something about it. It means to be unified. It means to be identified. To be in unity with someone is to be unified with them and to be identified with them. And and that's what it means to trust Christ as your Savior. You become one with him by asking him into your life. And then you identify with him. You're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not ashamed to be a part of his local church, of other broken people who were saved and redeemed by his blood, by the second Adam. And you follow him in believer's baptism as an act of identifying with him. Look at verse 20. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. I love this verse because Paul reminds us, especially you that are thinking, I'm listening to you. I'm feeling a conviction. I'm feeling a need in my life. I'm feeling there's something stirring in me in this message. So I'm going to go out and try harder to be good. I'm going to try harder to keep the law. Paul is here thinking that. He's anticipating that among the Romans and us that he's saying to us, the law can't save you, friend. Matter of fact, the more your trespasses increase, the more God's love for you increases the more grace has abounded to you. And for you who think you've gone too far, I'm telling you, Christ is saying to you right now, you haven't gone too far. My grace is greater. If you think your life is a dam that stops God from getting into you, his love is a tsunami that rides over that dam. Paul reminds us the law can't save us. Imagine, tragically, and as our president announced this past week, we will probably see this touch our families and our lives, maybe we even, even we ourselves, imagine that you're infected by the coronavirus. What do you need from me as your pastor? What do, what do you need from me as a gospel preacher? I'll tell you what you don't need. You don't me, need me giving you the law. Hear the laws. Don't get chills. Hear the laws. Don't get body aches or sneeze. Hear the laws. Don't get a headache with this coronavirus. It's like saying, don't smoke, don't lust, don't chew. Don't hang out with bad people. Those are symptoms of our sin. The sin core is in our heart and only Christ can change our heart. And every commandment that is given is a symptom of the deeper problem. And the deeper problem is we want it to be God and not let God be God for us. You need a doctor and you need a specialist who specializes in your disease. And not only is he a specialist, Dr. Jesus, And I don't mean to be corny, but it's perfectly true. Dr. Jesus can heal you. He can save you. No matter what happens in this series, no matter what happens in this trial, no matter what happens in the times we live in, they may become more perilous. I pray not. I pray diligently that that God will give us relief. We're hoping that this, this curve that we're watching the next two weeks will get pressed down. But folks, we still have a problem, even if we're successful as Americans. We still have a problem, and it's the deep sin sickness of our soul, and we need a Savior. Five times in these verses we've just read, it uses the phrase free gift. You see, Jesus could have patented this, but he didn't. He didn't patent it. He open-sourced it. He gave it to everyone free of charge. Think in economic terms. There's a worldwide demand right now, but there's only one supply. There's only one source, and the price is precious, it is infinite, but it has been paid in full. And Jesus died. But oh my friend, it doesn't stop there as we will celebrate next Sunday on Easter Sunday. I don't care where we're at or how we're coming to one another. We will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ because not only did he die, he rose again. And in his resurrection, he defeated sin and death. This is my hope and this is our hope and this is where we plant our flag. No matter what happens, our God has given us a gift of everlasting life. And even this life, if we lose this life, we gain him in eternity. Have you trusted Jesus? Have you trusted that he's done everything necessary to save you? If not, why not now? Think about those words we read a moment ago in Romans 10. How simple and powerful and profound it is. If you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Trust him today as your savior. Ask him right now. Just if you wish, if if, if it would help you, bow your head, close your eyes and pray a simple prayer like this. Jesus, I am infected by sin. 
And I believe you're the antidote for my infection. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to save me. Be the Lord of my life. And thank you for your love and thank you for your grace that has just removed all of my sin and given me the perfect life that you lived so that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Friend, with your head bowed and eyes closed, would, would you just thank God for hearing your prayer? That's what it means to believe, that we now receive his gift, and some of you are feeling something very different in your heart, some of you are not, doesn't matter. When you put your trust in Christ, you trust what he did and what he said to be true. And someday when you stand before him, you will simply say, I trusted you. And friend, no one will ever regret trusting Christ to save them. The life he has for you now, I pray, will be full of the blessing of healing and strength and power and love that you will care about your neighbors and their condition. So I ask you, who can you talk to about this? Who can you tell? Maybe even in the living room where you're at. Maybe when you open your eyes, tell, tell your mate, tell a friend, tell a parent, I just asked Jesus into my heart. Tell us. Nothing would thrill us more than to know that God has spoken to you and saved you. And you go to our website at goredemption.com and there's a big button right there that basically says connect card. If you'll click that and just let us know, I prayed. Maybe on that card, you wanna tell us about a prayer need in your life. It will not be gossiped about, it will be prayed about. Maybe there's a need in your life physically or financially. Let us know and we will pray with you and, and do whatever we can to love you and help you through this crisis. Lord Jesus, we worship you now for you are a great and awesome God and you are greatly to be praised in Jesus' name.
Redemption Church, thank you for joining us uh, this morning, uh, tuning in on, on radio, or maybe you're, you're around uh, with your family. Um, I, I want to echo what uh, and mention what Pastor Ed already did. If you uh, made a decision this morning, and you, we would love the opportunity to pray with you, come alongside you, uh, and journey with you in this new life that you've found um, by going to goredemptionchurch.com slash connect. You'll see that in the, the chat box on your right-hand side, or you can go to our website and find that link as well. We'd, we'd love to know uh, of your decision and how we can begin to pray for you and support you. Uh, I also want to make mention of uh, one more website. It's goredemption.com slash gospel. Maybe you just need some more information about this decision. Maybe uh, you want to understand a little bit more of, of who Jesus is in your life. And there's some resources on that page we'd love to direct you to. Church family, it is so great to be together with you. Jesus truly is our antidote. Here at Redemption Church, we don't dismiss. We always sin. So God bless you, are a sin people. We'll see you this week.